news and analysis. We own news. Welcome, you're watching Gravitas with me, Molly Gambhir. Here's a quick look at what's lined up for you on the show tonight. Our cover story tonight is about China's silent war on India. This will shock you. A man has been accused of spending millions of dollars in India in order to spread pro-China propaganda. That's right, it's a sinister ploy to say the least. It's a silent war and a murky web of trying to buy bias and influence. Who exactly is this man? What's behind this plan and how exactly was he executing it? Who all were involved and how was the lid blown off? On Gravitas tonight, we get you these answers as we join the dots and bring you the bigger picture. Also on the show for you tonight, Stockholm has emerged as Europe's new crime capital. We tell you why the crime rates in Sweden have been attracting global concern now. There is a new COVID variant on the prowl, should you be worried. Iran is gaslighting women who defy the hijab law and sending them off to take psychiatric treatment. Are you too drunk to drive back home? Italy has a plan to get you home safe. We tell you more. Our cover story is about a man who has been accused of waging a war in India. It's a fireless war. It's a war of narrative, a war of misinformation and disinformation. It is China's war of influence. And Beijing's foot soldier in this war is Neville Roy Singham. A New York Times investigation has accused him of spending millions of dollars in India in order to spread pro-China propaganda. But this is not the first time Singham's name has come up for something fishy. Raids previously have led Indian authorities to Singham. Now, don't get fooled by his Bollywoodish name. Neville Roy Singham is an American, but he sits thousands of miles away in Shanghai, close to the Chinese seat of power, running his large network of propaganda machines masquerading as shell companies and NGOs. Last week, Singham was reportedly attending a workshop on ways to spread Chinese propaganda. He once founded a company called ThoughtWorks Inc. The website claims, Roy is a globally renowned information technology thought leader. So why is this thought leader being accused of influencing people's thoughts in favor of China? Why is he oiling the Chinese propaganda machinery in India? 
Is his resume nothing but a cover? In India, Singham reportedly poured money into a website called News Click. It is run by PPK News Click Studio Private Limited. In the year 2021, this website came under the radar of India's Enforcement Directorate. ED claimed that News Click had received questionable foreign funding amounting to 38 crore rupees. So on the 9th of February, the ED raided News Click. At least 10 of its premises were searched. The raid lasted five days. New York Times now claims, I'm quoting, Singham's network financed a news site, News Click, that sprinkled its coverage with Chinese government talking points. And this is what the website looks like. Nothing obviously suspicious there. No red color or Chinese flag, of course. Not too long ago, News Click filed a story that declared Oppenheimer film should remind us who is the real enemy of the people. And who is that? Definitely not China. The story reads, and I'm quoting, for young internationalists and anti-imperialists in the United States, it is essential for us to listen clearly to the people of West Africa and the Sahel. Western media has been spinning nefarious tales of Russian and Chinese growing influence in the region. Two years ago, News Click filed this story. China claims to achieve eradication of absolute poverty. Also two years ago, News Click asked, can China lead the way to a low-cost, low-carbon future? And here's another story. Economically, the US is a declining power. China is a rising power. The message is clear. China will only follow the path of socialism. How US aggression on China will destabilize global trade and tech. Would you call the reportage slash coverage neutral or is there an obvious bias there? Singham is accused of buying this bias on behalf of China. How exactly, you wonder? Through charities and shell companies. In April 2018, for example, a company named Worldwide Media Holdings LLC invested 9.59 crores into PPK News Click. Worldwide Media is now defunct. It was based out of Delaware and it was part of Singham's network. Between 2018 and 2021, NewsClick received money from four different entities linked to Singham. It in fact received 27.51 crore from Justice and Education Fund located in the United States, 26.98 lakhs from G-SPAN LLC, again located in the United States, 49.31 lakhs came in from the Tricontinental Limited Inc. USA, and 2.03 lakhs were sent from a certain Centro Popular Demidas Brazil. And what was this money for? Export of services claimed News Click. What services? New York Times claims to have quote unquote tracked hundreds of millions of dollars to groups linked to Singham that mix progressive advocacy with Chinese government talking points. News Click mind you, is just one of the many ways in which Singham is pushing the Chinese narrative into the mainstream discourse. Singham finances YouTube videos that promote pro-Chinese narrative. In Shanghai, for example, one of his companies co-produced a YouTube show along with the city's propaganda department. Singham finances NGOs that slyly tow the Chinese line. The New York Times also claiming that Singham and his network meet, from, uh, meet congressional aides, train politicians in Africa, they help in organizing protests, and the end goal here is to create an eco chamber where the Chinese narrative is celebrated, even promoted. And then when protesters or a politician paid by Singham or trained by Singham says something pro-China, New York Times claims Chinese media accounts retweet people and organizations in Singham's network at least 122 times since February 2020. Nothing here is genuine. 
everything is tailored, orchestrated and funded, it seems, to suit the Chinese propaganda campaign. Neville Roy Singham is a reminder of how China's narrative war has gone beyond state-funded media outlets and the Confucius Institute. Beijing has spread its tentacles, roped in third parties. They may be anywhere, they may be anyone. What may look like independent content or a journalistic piece on China may, ha may have its roots soaked in Chinese money and tasked with influencing your views on China, making you look at the world through China's lens and fall for the Chinese lie. Only a few years back, Sweden was a peaceful welfare state. Well, not anymore. A lot has changed. And now it has become Europe's crime capital, a hotspot of gun homicides, in fact, the number of shootings has shot up in Sweden and how. Gang violence is soaring, perpetrators have become younger, more and more teenagers are taking up guns, firing bullets from rifles they can barely hold. Have a look at these headlines. This one is from June. There was a shooting in the Swedish capital Stockholm. A 15-year-old boy was killed. Three other people were injured. Soon there was a car chase, two suspects were arrested. The motive of the attack still remains unknown. And then there was this case of revenge shooting. Serdar Sarehan was a real estate agent in Stockholm. He came from a family of Turkish migrants. For years, in fact, Serdar built up a good life for himself and his family. But his son, created trouble. He went off the rails in his late teens. In March, a Swedish television program broadcast Edem's name and photograph. He was wanted in connection with a shooting in Uppsala. The shooting targeted the family of an infamous crime baron. And this painted a target on the backs of Edem's relatives. Soon after the broadcast, gunmen knocked on his father's door. Sadar Sarehan was shot dead as his wife and daughter slept upstairs. Another 15-year-old was shot dead in January, not in an isolated alleyway or a shady area, by the way, but in a sushi restaurant in a crowded shopping plaza. He was shot between his eyes, execution style, in front of a room full of diners. Another 15-year-old was later arrested on suspicion of his murder. And days before this, two explosions rocked an apartment block in a suburb in Stockholm. A mother and daughter cried as they saw a football-sized hole in the wall of their home. The police believe it was in retaliation for a shooting outside a McDonald's restaurant, which killed one and injured two. Harrowing, isn't it? One crime leading to another. A chain of shootings and revenge shootings. And these were just a few cases, by the way. According to police records, 144 such incidents took place in the first five months of 2023. Do you know what that means? On an average, there was one shooting every day. At least 20 people have been killed due to gun violence this year. Last year, there were 391 shootings in Sweden. 62 people were killed. And a year before that, there were 344 shooting incidents. 45 had been murdered. Sweden has roughly the same population as London. Yet, the gun murder rate in its capital, Stockholm, was roughly 30 times higher per capita than London. It was also 2.5 times the European average. It's still far better off than the United States, but according to European standards, it's alarming to say the least. While the level of violent crime has stayed relatively stable in Sweden, the proportion of deadly gun crime and attacks with explosives has skyrocketed. Lives have been lost. Laws and policies have been changed. 
the violence even brought down a whole government gang. Crime was the divining issue of last year's election campaign, but the shootings and the explosions have only increased. The government pins the blame on the integration of migrants. Today, one-fifth of all people living in Sweden were born outside the country. An overwhelming majority of gang criminals are young Swedish men born abroad or whose parents or grandparents emigrated to the country. In the 2015 asylum wave, Sweden imported all kinds of criminality due to migrants. But Germany, for that matter, took in even more refugees and is not facing such issues. So again, the question is, why is this happening in Sweden? Here's what the police suspect. Gang leaders in Sweden are hungry for power. They are competing to control illegal drug sales. And the race has now turned deadly. It has evolved into a cycle of revenge attacks. Warring factions have been rampaging around Stockholm. Gangsters use bombs to send each other warnings. Assassins shoot one another dead. Young children immune from prosecution under Swedish law are being sent to carry out the attacks. Such is the state of affairs in Sweden. How will it solve its gun problem then? The country's police union has urged the government to set up a crisis commission. The government has boosted the budget for police and the criminal justice system. Yet, the shootings have continued unabated. The most striking aspect here is how normal they have become. The crimes are being reported as part of everyday life. Sweden is giving the world Nordic noir fiction. And it does not seem to be ending anytime soon. And here's something else that's not ending soon. The pandemic. Thanks to the multiple new variants of COVID-19. Reports say a new COVID-19 variant is spreading quickly in the UK. It goes by the name of Eris. How fast is this variant spreading and how lethal is it? Our next report explores. A new COVID variant is on the prowl. It goes by the name of Eris or EG 5.1 and accounts for 1 in 10 COVID cases in the UK. When was this variant discovered? How fast is it spreading? And how lethal is it? Let's find out. To start with, when was this variant discovered? Well, Eris was initially identified as a COVID variant only on 31st July. It was discovered to be a sub-variant of the Omicron strain. UK's health security agency said it was spreading at a rapid pace. How rapid? What is the transmissibility rate of the variant? Well, not many details are available about the transmission rate of Eris. But if we go by the surge in COVID cases and hospital admissions in the UK, they indicate that sitting back calmly won't really help. Just like other COVID variants, this one too is likely to infect many. According to reports, in the week beginning July 10th, approximately 11.8 of UK sequences were identified as Eris. The data from August indicates that this figure has climbed to a worrisome 14.6% of all cases. What about symptoms? Are we seeing a change in symptoms? Not really. So far, there have been no reports of new symptoms. Experts say Eris 2 has inherited the symptoms of previous strains, like runny nose, headache, fatigue, sneezing and sore throat. And the most important question of them all, what is driving the surge in cases? The first reason is bad weather. Due to the heat, many people are staying indoors. And due to less air circulation inside the homes, people are ending up catching respiratory infections easily. In some cases, these infections make them more susceptible to catching COVID-19. The second reason is the waning immunity from COVID vaccines. Experts say taking COVID vaccines and booster shots can strengthen immunity in people. And in case you're down with it, be isolated. Get tested and maintain proper hygiene. Pure Report, we on World is One.
Do you know the meaning of the word hysteria? It is a state in which a person cannot control their emotions. Do you know where this word comes from? It is derived from the Greek and Latin words for uterus. For the longest time, hysteria was considered a mental disorder that plagued only women, something that came along with the uterus and feminine hormones. You heard that right. Doctors, in fact, readily diagnosed women with hysteria for anything that made men uncomfortable. Today, you and I know better than believing in this sexist theory. But there is one whole country that does not. That's Iran. It is back with its hijab rule and women who are not complying with it are being sent off to psychiatric centers. That's right, they are being labeled mentally ill. After months of protests, hundreds of hijabs burnt after Mehsa Amini's death, Iran's model police was back on roads, harassing women to cover their heads. And as if that was not enough, now the country's judiciary is resorting to medical solutions, as if exercising free will is a mental condition. Healthcare organizations have raised concerns. They are warning that the judiciary is hijacking psychiatric medicine for its own purposes. This is scary to say the least. At the face of this movement is Iranian actress Afsane Baigan. In a symbolic act of defiance, Baigan has repeatedly posted photographs on Instagram. Have a look. As you can see, her hair is uncovered. She is not giving in to the hijab mandates. Began has also attended a public ceremony without a hijab. She's openly defying the hijab law. How did the Iranian authorities react to this is the immediate question. Well, they announced a two-year suspended prison sentence for Began. They also ordered her to visit a psychological center once a week. What for? Well, to treat her, quote-unquote, anti-family personality disorder. Let me just say that again. Anti-family personality disorder. Have you heard of this before? You might not have, unless you live in Iran. It is the latest tool the hardline regime is using against women. The country is failing so miserably to enforce its laws that it is now trying to gaslight women. To make them and the society believe that something is wrong with them. Aspane Baigan is not alone, in fact. Iranian judges also diagnosed actress Azadeh Samadhi. What symptoms, quote unquote, did Samadhi show? She wore a hat instead of a hijab at a funeral. And she will also have to seek weekly therapy in a psychological center. And then there is actress Leila Bolokat. She has been sentenced to one year in prison, banned from acting and traveling for two years. Bolokat is also barred from using social media for five years. She will have to read a book and provide its summary to the authorities within one month. Another woman was sentenced to two months in prison, six months of psychological treatment. Apparently, she had a contagious psychological disorder that leads to sexual promiscuity. In yet another case of extreme punishment, a Tehran court sentenced a woman to spend a month cleaning corpses in a morgue. The authorities are not even sparing children and young girls, by the way. The education minister, Yosef Nouri, has admitted this. Now, during the Mesa Amini protests, school children were detained in the streets or at school. They were held in, quote-unquote, medical psychological centers. They were re-educated, quote-unquote, to prevent anti-social behavior. You see, Iran is trying really hard to brainwash women. First of all, this is not the 18th century anymore. You see, this trick might have worked back then, but in today's day and age, it will not fly. Secondly, how can a judge diagnose someone with a health disorder? Last we checked, it was a doctor's job. 
how is a judge qualified to sign off a woman as mentally ill, quote unquote? He is not. Women are stepping out without, without hijabs. The government of Iran does not know how to deal with this. It is the first time women have so openly defied the hardline laws gone out against the regime. The authorities are desperate and they are turning to extreme punishments. Women are being charged with hefty fines. They are getting text messages if spotted driving without a hijab. Authorities, in fact, are confiscating vehicles. They are pressuring employers to fire women. Unveiled women have even been refused hospital treatment. Shops catering to them are being forced to shut down. And the crackdown is not likely to slow down anytime soon, by the way. Despite all of this, but women of Iran are defying the hijab mandate. Meanwhile, there is more rhetoric and chest thumping from China on Taiwan. It's China doing what it does best, muscle flexing and showing off. And this time it comes with a twist. China soldiers say they are ready to give up their lives if needed. According to reports, China has released a new documentary. What's it about? Well, it aims to show the army's preparation to attack Taiwan. And it's no ordinary documentary. It has soldiers pledging to give up their lives if needed. That's right. It features personal accounts, as per reports, of numerous PLA soldiers from different services and locations. The documentary is titled Zhu Meng or Chasing Dreams. Now, we know how Xi Jinping has been dreaming about invading Taiwan and China wants to show just how prepared it is to turn Xi Jinping's dream into reality. And it seeks to tell the world its soldiers are ready to die for this cause. First, let me tell you a little bit more about this documentary. Reports say it is an eight-part docu-series aired by the state broadcaster CCTV earlier this week to mark the People Liberation Army's 96th anniversary. And what does it show? It features military drills, also testimonials by dozens of soldiers. Several of them expressed their willingness to die in a potential attack against Taiwan. Basically, the idea is to try and show the world just how committed China's military personnel really are to be combat ready at any second. And the documentary also showcased the PLA's joint sword drills, which simulated precision strikes against Taiwan. The exercises, by the way, were undertaken around the self-governed island in April after a visit by the Taiwanese president Tsai Ing-wen to the United States. And the documentary also features Shandong, one of China's three aircraft carriers, sailing in formation with several other warships. In fact, the PLA has repeatedly dispatched Shandong to the Taiwan Strait over the past few months as a threat to Taiwan. Just a quick backgrounder here. As you may be aware, the Chinese government claims Taiwan as a province of China and has not ruled out taking it by force, unification, is a goal that is very close to Xi Jinping's heart. And according to Taiwan's president, Tsai Ing-wen, Taiwan is already a sovereign country. Now the thing is, under Xi Jinping's rule, aggression towards Taiwan has only increased. And what about the threat of invasion? The People's Liberation Army has been sending hundreds of warplanes into Taiwan's air defense identification zone. And this latest documentary is China's new way of sending out strong signals regarding its preparedness to attack Taiwan. At a time when tensions have been on the rise and international concern has been mounting, the idea is to show just how determined China really is. But the question is, Xi Jinping, is he actually going to try and realize his dream of making Taiwan a part of China? But who knows what really is on Xi Jinping's mind and whether or not the Russian invasion of Ukraine has emboldened him. But as of now, China is wasting no opportunity to pump out propaganda to show that it is ready to go to any length. Shifting focus for now, more than 10,000 species of plants and animals are at a high risk of extinction. 
This is as a result of the destruction of the Amazon rainforest. And now an increase in gold mining in these forests is poisoning scores of species. Our next report telling you more. Is breathing okay? This Amazonian rodent could be yet another victim of mercury contamination. Inside a camping tent in the middle of the Peruvian jungle, scientists are trying to determine just that. We started um, doing on-site testing for mercury because uh, we are in a region where there's a lot of gold mining extraction. Tests like this one are providing the first extensive indications that mercury from illegal gold mining in the Amazon rainforest is contaminating terrestrial mammals, from rodents to ocelots to TD monkeys. Peruvians have mined gold for centuries. Over the past 15 years, the southeastern region of Madre de Dios has become an epicenter of small-scale mining, where some 46,000 miners are searching for gold along riverbanks. The vast majority of them operate illegally in protected areas or informally with little regulatory oversight. Some researchers say the miners often disregard environmental laws. The miners also use toxic liquid mercury to separate precious metal from sediment. Wildlife biologist Gideon Erkenswick. And so mercury in this process runs off into the environment or gets burned and then um, uh, becomes an aerosol that, that goes all over the place. Animals can ingest mercury through their diet from the water they drink or the air they breathe. Reuters accompanied the researchers and Madre de Dios and reviewed their previously unreported findings. Since 2018, the team from the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance, the California nonprofit Field Projects International, and Peruvian partner Conservación Amazonica have collected samples from more than 2,600 animals, representing at least 260 species. The main animal groups that we work with include birds, bats, mm -hmm. uh, non-human primates, small animals, uh, so rodents and marsupials, some medium-sized mammals, and um, amphibians and reptiles. From each of those capture events, we collect a range of non-lethal tissues, buccal swabs, skin swabs, nail clippings, a single blood draw, and then we release the animals. Of the 330 primate samples tested so far, virtually all showed mercury contamination. How this will affect their health is not clear. Veterinarian toxicologist Caroline Moore. There is a general concern that, you know, if, if the mercury levels get high enough and are consistent enough and prevent animals from reproducing successfully, or if they have um, a baby, that the baby cannot successfully grow up to be an adult. The rapid expansion of mining operations in the Amazon rainforest is seen by regional governments as an environmental and health threat. The Peruvian government estimates that illegal miners dump about 180 metric tons of mercury in Madre de Dios annually. In 2019, the government declared a state of emergency in that region and deployed 1,500 police and soldiers to crack down on illegal mining. The Environment Ministry did not respond to Reuters' questions about mercury contamination. In the years to come, scientists hope to create a long-term data set in Peru and other mining hotspots to understand how mercury could be affecting mammals globally. We're wondering, you know, are the birds exposed? If so, how? And if the birds are exposed, who else is exposed? Are the humans exposed? Are these, you know, megafauna also exposed? And what does it all mean? And so we're slowly building up that picture. Um, and what we build up here can then be applied other places in the world where mining um, and mercury exposures are a concern. And our next story is about moonlighting. You know, the trend where you have a side job besides your primary source of employment, where you take up a second job, basically, apart from your full-time job. Well, this trend is back in the news again, this time courtesy British lawmakers. That's right. A new report states that since the year 2019, British MPs have been paid £15.2 million, mostly from second jobs and freelance work. And what's worse, 
This is happening despite the fact that consecutive British governments have signaled imposing restrictions on the MPs for taking on second jobs. And if I speak of the numbers, there are about 90 Conservative MPs who earned around £4.75 million in the last one year. An unsaid number of uh, Labour, SNP and Liberal Democratic MPs also earned around £400,000. And guess who earned the most? Former British Prime Minister Boris Johnson. He reportedly earned around £4.8 million the last year. Yes, Boris Johnson's extra income accounts for almost half of the overall figure. And what was his source of income, you wonder? A host of second jobs and lucrative gigs outside of politics. In fact, reports say he charged a huge fee for speaking at events overseas after he was kicked out of Downing Street. Besides this, Boris Johnson also struck a £510,000 deal with HarperCollins in January to pen a memoir called Like No Other. And Johnson is also said to have secured a quote-unquote very high six-figure sum to write his new weekly column for the Mail. Interestingly, he's not the only prominent British leader to be doing this. His successor, Liz Truss, who lasted at 10 Downing Street for only six weeks, also does a host of second jobs. In fact, reports say she has the highest hourly rate of any current MP, making a mammoth £15,000 per hour. So does Theresa May, by the way. The former Prime Minister, Theresa May, is also one of the biggest recipients of money through second jobs. She reportedly took home £2.5 million on top of her parliamentary salary. This was mainly from giving out speeches to organizations in the U.S., such as J.P. Morgan Bank and the private equity firm Apex Partners. Another name mentioned in the report is of the labor leader, Kies Tame. He received around £26,000 from legal work conducted while being a serving Labour MP. Another name is of Geoffrey Cox. He has reportedly earned £2.2 million from legal work in the last three years while serving as a Tory MP. He received much of this amount for his work advising the tax haven of British Virgin Islands. What does all of this tell you? That there is not one party that can be blamed for all of this. British MPs across the political spectrum are earning a fortune through second jobs. Can they be allowed to do that though? This is a question the people of the UK must ask their leaders. Sri Lanka is looking to transform its education system. End of term examinations are being scrapped. Students will now be given just one workbook each term. Colombo says the idea here is to reduce the weight of the school bags and also to help the children keep their spine straight. But will these measures interfere with a child's learning curve? Here's a detailed report. There aren't too many people who would tell you that they love exams. The word is often synonymous to nightmares sweaty palms, anxiety and last moment preparation. Which is why we are sure students in Sri Lanka are celebrating today. The country's education ministry has decided to relieve the students of the burden of exams. Starting in 2024, students in Sri Lanka will be able to take only one exam a year. How many do they currently take? Mostly one every term. So say a school has three terms, spring, summer and winter then the students have to take three exams every year. That comes down to one now. What's more, starting in 2024, students will have just one workbook for each term. So, if there are three terms, students will have just three workbooks for each academic year. Here's a question. How much can you possibly fit into that workbook and how many subjects? It is unclear whether the plan is to have one workbook per subject or one workbook for all subjects. The latter can be disastrous Sri Lanka's Minister of Education, Susil Premajayanta, says the reduction in workbooks will make the school bags lighter, also help the students keep their spine straight. But will it be at the cost of compromising with the students' learning curve? There is no doubt that a no-exam situation is utopian. 
but the reality is that exams often help keep a tab on a child's progress. Is she understanding the concepts being taught to her or does she need remedials? How will teachers or parents figure this out with a performance evaluation? If a child underperforms or god forbid fails at the end of the year, she stands to lose a whole academic year, which again is less than ideal. Sri Lanka plans to have assessments at the end of each module. But the policy's ultimate goal remains blurry. There is the talk of reducing the weight of the school bag and reducing the burden on school students. But the minister also spoke about saving money through this policy. How? He said that one exam a year will save parents the money spent on private tuitions or coaching classes that promise to train the children for competition. Prema Jayanta went on to say that the tuition money could then be spent on food and nutrition. So, is Sri Lanka really looking to transform education? Or is this a way to help Lankans cope with the economic situation at the cost of basic learning? Bureau Report, We On, World Is One. Have you been dreaming of travelling to Italy? Well, other than the pastas and the pizzas, here is another addition to the list. A free pass to get drunk and yet reach home safely. You heard that right. If you have a couple of extra drinks in Italy and are not in a state to drive back home, you will not have to worry about booking an expensive ride. You will not have to appoint a friend as the designated driver either. Because the government will sponsor your ride home. Here's how this will work. Revelers who appear too drunk while exiting a party will have to take an alcohol test. And if they are over the limit, a taxi will be called to take them home safe. And here's the fun part. It will be at the state's expense. The funding will be provided by the Transport Ministry from Puglia in the south to Tuscany and Benito in the north. The pilot project, in fact, will run until mid-September at six Italian nightclubs. What is the motive behind this? Of course, to rein in drunk driving and also to curb deadly accidents. Driving under the influence of alcohol is a major cause of road crashes in Italy. In fact, the level of acceptance of drunk driving in Italy is higher as compared to other EU countries. Just 20% of Italians think that they will be caught if they drink and drive. Based on the national police data in 2020, in fact, 9.2% of the injury crashes were related to drunk driving. Approximately 26,000 fines were issued for drunk driving. Italy is one of the world's favorite travel destinations. Millions of tourists visit it every year and people don't tend to count their drinks while on a vacation. The scheme kicked off over the weekend. So far, it has largely received a positive response. Many are happy about the free ride home. Others say it will significantly reduce car crashes on the roads. On the first night itself, 21 people were taken away in the government-funded taxis. People now have an excuse to party even harder, it seems. While all that is well and good, the project has also been criticized. Critics argue that it unjustly rewards people who drink too much. And rightly so. Not having to worry about getting back home safe will let partygoers take an extra drink or two. It is a smart move by the government for more than one reason. The alcohol consumption will likely go up, so will the revenue. More tourists will come in, ultimately boosting the country's economy. And as you already know, road accidents will dial down. Overall, it seems like a win-win situation for Italy. Let's now tell you what else made news around the world. Time for Gravitas Global Headlines. The Philippines summoned Beijing's envoy after the China Coast Guard blocked and water cannoned Philippine vessels in the disputed South China Sea. Manila says it will never abandon Philippine-held shoal in the South China Sea. Niger has closed its airspace until further notice, citing the threat of military intervention from the West African regional bloc ECOWAS. 
This comes after coup leaders rejected a deadline to reinstate the country's ousted president, Mohamed Bazoum. A representative of the junta said it had information that a foreign power was preparing to attack Niger in coordination with countries of the ECOWAS bloc. At least 30 people died and over 100 have been injured in a deadly train derailment in Pakistan. The passenger train went off track in the southern Sindh province on Sunday. Rescue operations have concluded and cleanup work has started at the site. The lower house of the Indian parliament passed the Digital Personal Data Protection Bill stating obligations for entities processing data. Violators liable to a minimum fine of 50 crore rupees. That's over six million dollars. Russia is set to launch a lunar lander later this week. The Kremlin says the Luna 25 moon lander is set to be carried by a Soyuz rocket and it is ready for launch on the 11th of August. Fire broke out at India's premier hospital Ames in the national capital New Delhi. No casualties were reported in the fire which started on the second floor of the hospital. At least six fire tenders were sent to the spot to douse the fire. The cause of the fire is still unclear. More than a thousand military troops have been dispatched to fortify flood defenses and evacuate residents in northeast China. This as persistent rainfall has damaged roads, cut off the telecommunications in several parts of China's Jilin province. The troops are deployed for search and rescue operations, repairing damaged roads and distribute supplies to those in distress. Hundreds of people have been evacuated as massive wildfires blaze across Italy, Spain and Portugal. And as temperatures continue to rise, experts predict the risk of wildfires and heat waves is expected to escalate. In Portugal, around 17,000 acres have been destroyed and at least 11 people reported injured in the blaze. Reigning European champions England booked their sport in the quarterfinals of the FIFA Women's World Cup following a 4-2 penalty shootout victory over Nigeria. Co-hosts Australia are also through to the last eight after their 2 nil win over Denmark. Kristina Simanuskaya, the Belarusian sprinter who defected at the Tokyo Olympics two years ago, has been cleared by World Athletics to compete for Poland after it waived the normal three-year waiting period for nationality changes. On that note, it's a wrap on this edition of Gravitas tonight. We are leaving you with Gravitas images. Thanks very much for watching. Make your reservation at yo1.com. It's easy to tell you a flat story. It's easy to show you what's happening around the world. We do the difficult part. This weapon has been banned, but the US, Ukraine and Russia do not find the bombs problematic. We also tell you why what's happening. 
new drug is making a difference in the fight against Alzheimer's. This medicine helps slow down a patient's cognitive decline. We look beyond the text. We give you context. Is China preparing for a war in the Himalayas? And tonight, we come to you with some proof. Hypocrisy is stunning. Do leaders mean what they say? Do they ever say what they mean? To find out how real news affects you, your decisions. Just when Iran took one step in the right direction, its moral police is planning to drag it further back. And once again, the victim will be women. Watch Gravitas. We don't impose our views. Did India threaten to ban Twitter? Either that or Jack Dorsey is lying to you. That is Gravitas. We let life breathe through our show. Gravitas, the informed show for an intelligent audience. Hi, I'm Alison LaGrange and you're watching E-Club. Here are the nominees for achievement in music. People are totally wrong who keep telling me that, oh, you're multitasker, I'm not. Awards and fashion shows are in full swing. Seeing a young, you know, black man, you know, directing uh, a feature film, I saw myself in him. Engage with us. Let us know what you'd like to see on the show and celebrities that you'd like us to feature. how to fix the holes in our ozone layer. You don't know how to bring the salmon back up in a dead stream. You don't know how to bring back an animal now extinct. And you can't bring back the forest that once grew where there is now a desert. You have ignored us in the past and you will ignore us again. We have run out of excuses and we are running out of time. Show us your faithfulness. 